grading for me though, so that's all right. Um, so let's just talk about a couple of uh, things here before we get started. Um, your test is starting to come up. Uh, it's coming up here pretty soon now. So first test is next Thursday. Okay. Yeah. That sounded almost like you were going to vomit. I appreciate you not doing that in class. Uh, yeah, please, please don't do that. Um, I've had that happen before, and it's not, it's not pleasant for anybody. Um, okay, so next Thursday, first test. So here's what, here's what we're going to do. We're going to cover one section this week, and you will have another assignment. The assignment will actually be due at the test. So I'm going to give you nine days on the next assignment. Um, otherwise, if you turn it in Tuesday, then I won't have it done, and it's just it's not really advantageous really for you to turn it in on Tuesday rather than next Thursday. So I'm just going to give you two more days for it, okay? So you can turn it in um, next Thursday. Uh, I'm going to give you a few more problems, but it's like I said, it's only one section. You have nine days to, to work on it. So I think um, you should have plenty of time to finish it. Um, so we're going to spend two days on that. Next Tuesday, we will review, and um, I'll also... Right now, I'll go ahead and, and just kind of give you a very rough idea of the kind of things I would be expecting on the exam. I'm going to listen up to this, okay? Um, I'm not going to, for example, ask you to prove the, the division algorithm on the exam, okay? Um, I'm not going to ask you to write two-page proofs on the, on the test. What I'm going to be doing is, roughly, here's what I'm going to do on the exam. Um, I'm going to ask you, I may ask you the statement of the division algorithm. State exactly what it says. Right? This is what we did last time, this big, long proof. I'm not going to have you do that. I certainly ask you statements of theorems. Um, you know, state the binomial theorem, for example. Right? There's another thing I could, I could ask you. I could ask you to state the first principle of mathematical induction, right? or the second, things like this. These are fair game. Um, I could ask you definitions. And as far as, as uh, proofs go, um, you will see that will show up, but they will not be overly complicated, okay? They will certainly be of the form, that, of the flavor that you've, you've seen before. And probably, they will not be the, among the hardest problems you've done, okay? There will be things that you really should be able to do. Um, so that's, that's just very roughly what you should be looking at, all right? Um, since you've been, that's what we've been doing is proofs. That's what the point of the course is. So of course you should expect that you're going to have a proof or two to do on the exam. Um, but it will be reasonable. It will be reasonable. I don't expect you to, to be clever and come up with all these good creative ideas on the spot when you're nervous, okay? I don't expect you to do that. So you don't have to worry about that. Okay. So, um, and my plan right now, we'll see how this goes. My plan right now is what you're turning in. You've, you've turned in two sections. So I'm, my plan as of now is to count them both as separate assignments. Okay, so you'll get two grades for this assignment. Um, I may not do that depending on how uh, the grading goes. If I start to get really, really upset, then maybe I won't do that. But no, I'm just, I'm, I won't. Um, that, I'm sure that's what I'll do. So, um, all right, well, let's go ahead and move on then to uh, 2.3. See, this is the better thing. Oh, the homework you're turning in today? Yeah. Yes, for sure. Okay. You definitely will. You'll have it back before the test. Okay. Yeah. You will not have it back on Thursday. I can tell you that. There's no way I'll get through those two by Thursday. But you'll have it back next Tuesday. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and the, the new section will be on the test? No, 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 no. 2-3 will be on the test. Yes. We're, because we're not doing anything new next week. Next week is just review. But, but this, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a week and a half before the exam. So this, this will definitely be on the exam. So everything that we covered through this section will be fair game on the test. Yeah. Okay, so this section, uh, this is something you, you actually learned about these things a long time ago. You, you might have learned about this in fifth or sixth grade. We're going to take a much uh, different approach to this. This is not going to be just what's the GCD of seven and nine. It's, it's not going to be like that. But I'm sorry, yeah, it's going to get a little, just a little more complicated than that. Um, yeah, <laughs> right. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to bring in rocks then, I guess. Okay. Um, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to go straight into the definition because you've, you've, you've all seen this before. I'll, I'll, I'll do a um, couple examples for you here in a second.
we're going to start off with something even more basic than, than this. Okay, so A and B are integers. Okay, divisor. A is a divisor of B. There's about a thousand and seventeen names for this. I'm just going to give you a few of them. Or a factor of B or B is a multiple of A. Sorry, this is really tedious, but I, I'm just going to cover all my bases here. Yes, there's more. Um, okay. This is the last one I'm going to tell you. A divides B if So what does it mean? Well, there are a lot of ways you can say this, but the easiest way to, to say it is just that, um, here, let me just put an asterisk around this. Just means that when you divide, there's no remainder. Of course, the division algorithm, what we're dividing by was assumed to be positive, but um, that's the rough idea. So just to say it formally, it just means that A times X equals b for some integer x. OK. So uh, just do a quick example of this. I don't think I need to belabor this too much. But um, just to make sure that you all are aware that you all know what this is. This is very, very basic stuff. Four, uh, I'll probably usually default to saying divides. Four divides 16 because it goes into 16 with no remainder. That's all it means. Okay? Yes? When you say for some integers, that's just of saying it's, it's an element of Z? Yes. Yeah. So another way of saying it is shorthand would be AX equals B for some X epsilon Z. Yeah. Is that what you're asking? Yep. Yes. Yeah. So 4 divides 16 since, you just have to get used to this notation. You may not have seen this before. Since 4 times an integer, namely 4, equals 16, right? The notation being the bar. Yes. Yep. Yep, just a vertical bar. But, and also just to introduce this notation, which you'll see a lot, 2 does not divide 3, so that's just a bar with a little slash mark through it. Um, I don't think I'm even going to go into to this. Um, you could certainly prove this, but I'm, I'm not going to do that. I think you all believe that 2 is not a factor of 3, right? I mean, if, if it was, then you'd have 2x equals 3 for some integer x, but then x would be 3 halves. That's 1.5. That's, not, that's actually not an integer. So you can't do it, right? Okay. So here is what I'm going to do now. The book presents this theorem, which I'm going to prove here. Um, basically, all I'm going to do today... Unfortunately, these, these things are going to take a little bit of time, is prove two theorems. And um, if we have some more time, I'll, I'll go into some examples. But um, Thursday, what I'd like to do is do mostly examples, and then Tuesday, same thing. OK, so now we've talked about this idea of multiple or factor or divisor. And so now we can prove some basic properties of this um, relation. And uh, we'll actually use some of these in a uh, proof that's coming up, which is now we're going to start to get into things that maybe you haven't seen that are not as obvious. Um, some of these I think you'll find to be pretty intuitive. So we're going to let A, B, and C be integers. So instead of stating everything at once and having you fall asleep even more quickly than you already will, um, 
I'm just going to break these down into pieces and I'm going to prove each of them separately. I think it'll just be easier to follow and stay awake this way. Okay, so the first thing uh, is pretty straightforward, I think. Yes, we're in 2, 3, the GCD, and now we're on theorem 1, and the setup is just that A, B, and C are integers. Okay, so the first part just says that uh, we don't know what A, B, and C are. They're just, they're just integers. A is a factor of 0. 1 is a factor of or divides A. And A divides A. doesn't matter what A is. This is always true. This is something that I think that you can prove yourself, probably. Okay, well, I'm just trying to, again, get you familiar with this notation. Remember, this, this vertical bar just means that it goes, it divides into it evenly without a remainder, okay? In other words, we're, so the first proposition, or the first thing we have to prove here is that A is a factor of zero. What do we have to prove? We have to prove that A times an integer equals zero. That's what it means to be a factor, right? What integer would we multiply A by to get zero? Zero. That's easy, right? It's very simple. Okay? So all we have to say is this. A times 0 equals 0. To prove that 1 divides A, what, is it, what do we need here? 1 times what? A equals A. And the last one, what do we want to write here? A times 1 equals A. That's it. All right? That's easy. Okay? Some of you are chuckling, like, well, I know, I know, <laughs> I'm aware that this is pretty easy, but um, it's, it's just good to get used to this notation, okay? Um, okay, the second one, let's see if I'm going to have room to do this. Um, all right, <coughs> I guess I can, maybe I can, okay, let me go down a little bit here. I don't know what's going to happen. Um, okay, do you guys have this down? Anyone need some more time? Yeah, I'm going to do that on this. I'm going to do that on this one. Yeah. Okay. Because we don't really need this for the next part, but. Okay, so the second is to prove that A is a factor of 1 if and only if. Okay, some of you have the book open and you're going to cheat here, but um, for those of you that don't have the book open, what, what can you say about A? If A is a factor of 1, then, then what does A have to be? Can it be 5? Can it be 0? What does it have to be? 1 or 1 or minus 1, right? Okay, so the, the proof here I'm going to give is, is not extremely formal, but I, I'm just really trying to convince you that this is the case. And I'm also trying to show you that, okay, the technique for proving an if and only if statement, we've talked about this before. If and only if, there are two subparts. The first part is you prove whatever the left statement is, you prove that that implies the right statement, then you assume that the right statement is true and, you, and then you deduce the, the other left statement. Okay, you have to do two things for if and only if statements. If you do it directly, that is. Okay, so, and here you're going to get used to this. Um, I'm going to just start introducing it now. What does this mean? The arrow going to the right means that we're going to assume the left-hand statement and we're going to deduce the right-hand one. And then the arrow going the other way means we're going to assume the right-hand statement and we're going to deduce the left one. Okay? So let's uh, assume that... I'm not even going to do the other implication because it's just so obvious, but um, let's assume that A divides 1. And I'm going to keep doing this because this, this will help you follow, and I think it will help you in your homework, too. We want to prove that A is plus or minus 1. Is that redundant? You're going to draw the arrow and then say, assume? No, I, I'm just, I'm, I mean, okay, so yes, it is. It is redundant. Um, so uh, for now, I'm just going to write it all out. But in the future, I, I probably won't. But yeah, this, in general, you would just write the right arrow. And that just sort of means you assume the left-hand side. Yeah. Okay. 
So what do we know? Because A divides 1, what do we have? We know that A times X equals 1, right? For some integer X, and I'm going to abbreviate this now a little bit, for some X in Z. So here's the thing to note. that x is not 0. Um, I'm, I'm not going to write out why, but I'm, I'm just going to have you think about it. Why can't x be 0? Because, well, if x was 0, then you would have 1 equals 0, which is not true. You guys see that? x certainly can't be 0, because you get a, something that's impossible. So that means we can divide, and we can get a is equal to 1 over x. And here's where I'm just, I'm, because I have more things I want to focus on here, I'm, I'm not going to get too precise here. If A is 1 over X and A is an integer, remember, A is an integer. A, B, and C are integers. That was the assumption in the beginning of the statement of the theorem. The only possibility for X is 1 or minus 1, right? X certainly can't be 0 or A, or a is undefined. If, if it's bigger than 1 or less than minus 1, then A in absolute value is between strictly between 0 and 1, and no integer has that property, right? If X is 5 or minus 10, we get something between strictly between 0 and 1 or strictly between minus 1 and 0. And no integer has, a, has either of those properties. OK? Oops, sorry. Um, yeah, no, that's what I wanted. OK. A is plus or minus 1 since x has to be plus or minus 1. OK. The other implication uh, if a is plus or minus, I'm not going to write it out. If a is plus or minus 1, then definitely a divides 1. 1 divides 1 because 1 times 1 is 1. Minus 1 divides 1 because minus 1 times minus 1 is 1. So that's just, I don't think there's any need for me to do that. So I'm just going to write this. Uh, hopefully you don't think I'm a, being a jerk here, but I think you should agree, hopefully agree with this, right? 1 and minus 1 both divide 1. That's, that's easy. OK. OK, so that takes care of the second part. All right. Any questions about B? It's okay. Okay, part C. If A divides B and C divides D. Um, here, okay. So I should I should say this because um, I didn't I didn't tell you what D is, but yes. Mm -hmm. Just because of all of the notation, I see mm -hmm. the lots of the forest and the trees here. Okay. What is the theorem we're trying to prove? Uh, the theorem we just proved, uh, so, so okay, um, there are a bunch of parts to this theorem. Right. And so what I'm doing is I'm just separating each of these and proving them individually. So this is sort of a conglomeration of a bunch of Actually, sub parts. Actually, let me ask you this. Is this in section 2.3 somewhere? Yes. Okay, I will read it myself. Yes, it's definitely all of that. Everything I'm doing here is, is in there. Yeah, okay. absolutely. I've just got a little bit lost. No, I understand. Yeah, that's, that's fine. Uh, okay, well, if you have any questions, just, just let me know. Okay, so I didn't tell you what D is. We just assumed A, B, and C were integers, but D is also an integer. Yeah. Okay, so if A divides B, C divides D, then A, C... Oops, that's not what I meant. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Okay, I didn't mean to write equals. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, I know. I'm a jerk. I suck. I should be fired. Okay. Okay, so let's see. What do I, what do I want to do here? This, this What's that? Oh, okay. Well, I guess I can do that. Uh, yeah, let me see. You know, this thing is, uh, the, for some reason, the, the eraser is here. There we go. Let me do the small eraser. There we go. 
Yeah, that's the problem. Is if you do the big one, it'll erase everything. Yeah. So, okay. Sorry about that. Okay, AC divides BD. That's what I wanted. Okay. So why is this true? Well, this this is actually not that hard if you just write down what the definition is. Okay, so we assume that A divides B and C divides D. And we're going to show that AC divides BD. All right, okay, so what do we know? So we have, since A divides B, we have AX equals B. Yeah, we're just going to end up substituting. And since C divides D, CY equals D, right? By the way, don't use, don't, be careful about reusing variables. You do not say, do, you do not say AX equals B and CX equals D. Because that, that implies that you mean that, this, that the X is the same. If you use the same letter, unless the context is very clear, the reader has to infer that you mean that X means the same thing. Okay? So be really careful about this. If A divides B and C divides D, those quotients certainly don't have to be the same. Right? 2 divides 4, 3 divides 9, but the quotient for the first part is 2, the second quotient is 3. So you don't want to use the same letter. Okay? So be careful about this. Yeah? A divides B and C, yeah, C divides D. So uh, that means that uh, A times X equals B, right, and CY equals, equals D. For some integers X and Y, right? Okay, so what do we get then? Thus, well, we can just multiply everything together, right? So we get AX times CY equals BD. Okay, multiply these together, multiply these together. That's where that comes from. I'm not going to use parentheses. I mean, I will in a second, but in general, you don't need to use parentheses and such. It's not ambiguous because multiplication is associative. You don't need parentheses. Okay. It's also commutative, so we can, you know, move the order around however we want. So AC times XY equals BD, and that proves that AC divides BD. Okay, so you can, again, you can regroup the terms however you want to. You can move everything around because multiplication is commutative, so we can just shuffle things around to, to get what we want, right? And now, things like that, okay, this came up before too. I, I'm going to mention this now again. You don't need to, to even say this. It's just sort of understood. You don't need to say that the product of two integers is an integer, the difference of two integers is an integer, the sum of two integers is an integer. You don't, need, don't worry about that. That's just understood. So you don't, you don't need to, to, to write that down, all right? Okay, is this all right? Let's see. Okay, so D. This is similar if A divides B and B divides C, then A divides C. Okay, and this is all I'm going to say here um, because I want to get through everything today that I want to get through. Um, this is similar to C. Okay, you just write it out and it just, it just ends up working out. This, is, this isn't anything that's really that difficult. Okay. And E, okay, so I'll, I'll write this out. And this says that A divides B and B divides A. If and only if. A 
A equals plus or minus B. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, prove this. All right, so everybody have this? Everybody have this down? Okay. Okay, so now that you've seen this arrow notation, um, I'm just still going to write this down again just so that it's on the screen so that you don't forget what our assumption is. Okay. A divides B and B divides A, and we have to show that A is plus or minus B. So we have, again, by our assumption, AX equals B and BY equals A, right? For some integers A and, uh, X and Y. Okay, so we're going to look at a couple of cases here. Case one is that B equals zero. You'll see, I think, why I'm separating these cases here in a second. Okay, so look at what we have up here. If we know that B is equal to zero, then what can we say about A? Yes. It has to be zero also. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right, exactly. Yep. That's right. That's right. Very good. Okay, so in this case, A has to be zero as well. And um, here's my question to you. So case one is B equals zero, then A has to be zero as well. We just proved that. If B and A are both zero, is this true? Is A equal to plus or minus B? Definitely true. A equals B and A equals minus B because they're both zero. In fact, they're both true in that case. Okay. And I'm just going to write that because it just should be obvious at this point, if A and B are both zero, that that is clearly true. Okay, so um, second case is that B is not zero. Whoa, that was huge. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> okay, B is not equal to zero. And here's what I'm going to do just to make this easier to follow. Let, let, me, uh, let me put a one under the first equation and a two under the second equation. You'll see where the not equal to zero comes into play here in a second. Okay, so we have AX equals B and BY equals A. So here's what I'm going to do. BY equals A, that's the second equation. So I'm going to replace the A in the first equation by BY. Okay, because we know it's equal to A. So I can certainly do that. So what we get then is BY times x equals b. So what can we conclude? Think about just some basic algebra now. What can we conclude here? If b y x equals b, what can we say? Y, y x equals 1. Why can we do that? 
because B is not zero. That's huge, right? That's why I have the two cases. If B was zero, you couldn't say that necessarily, right? You couldn't necessarily say that yx equals one. If b is zero, you could have zero times five times 10. B times zero, oh, sorry. B times five times 10 is certainly equal to b if b is zero, they're both zero. But five times 10 is not one. So it's important that you distinguish the two cases. Okay, so now what can we say? Um, well, okay, so we've got yx equals 1. Do you guys buy this? y divides 1, right? By definition, y definitely divides 1. You see that? Just from, from this, right here. And... If you look at part B, what can we say about Y? Well, not necessarily. Right? I think I have the labeling right. We did this in part B, didn't we? Every factor of 1 has to be 1 or minus 1. Since Y is a factor of 1, Y has to be plus or minus 1. But if we know, look, look back up here for a second. I'm trying not to break my uh, microphone. Look at this. Look at what we're trying to prove. We're trying to prove that A is plus or minus B, right? We know that Y is plus or minus 1. If Y is 1, then A is B. If Y is minus 1, then A is minus B. Therefore, A is plus or minus B. Make sense? Okay? Just, just look at whether or not one, uh, Y is 1 or minus 1, and then you get exactly what it is that we want to show. Okay, so I'm going to try to make this as clear as I can. By 2, then, A is plus or minus B, and that's exactly what we wanted to prove. Okay, let's see. And where are we at now? We're at uh, F, I guess. Okay, we're almost done, actually. Okay, so if A is a factor of B, uh, yes? Are we not going to do the reverse on the last one? Um, oh, right, right, right. So there was the other implication. Um, thank you. Sorry about that. But I'm not going to do it anyways. It's fine. It's easy. The other implication is obvious. If A is, is plus or minus B, then um, it's easy to check that A divides B and B divides A. So uh, if you want to write this in your notes, the other implication, easy. Okay? Sorry. I mean, it really, I'm, that's not me just saying, oh, it's easy for me. It really is easy. It really is. Okay? So I'm not going to do that. But thank you. Sorry. Thank you for bringing that up. I forgot to, to, do the, to state that about the other part. <clears throat> Okay, so the absolute value of A is less than or equal to absolute value of B. This should be not too surprising, right? I mean, intuitively, if you have A being a factor of B, then A is smaller than B in some sense. At least most of the time it is, right? Okay, that weird screaming sound is a stool, in case you're wondering what that is. Like, there's a ghost, it's, the room is haunted. Um, okay, so... So let's suppose that A divides B and B is not equal to zero. Okay, so again, at some point I'll probably stop saying explicitly every, every time what we're going to try to prove, but I'm just going to keep doing it now just for clarity. Prove that the absolute value of A is less than or equal to the absolute value of B. Um, so again, we have, or we know, or, or what have you, um, that uh, AX equals B. Since A divides B, AX equals B for some X 
in Z. Since B is not zero, right? Also, what can we conclude about A and X? Well, they can't be zero either, right? Because if either of them were zero, then B would have to be zero. So again, I'll uh, make this very clear. Okay, so also since AX equals B, See if you buy this. The absolute value of AX, we talked about this before briefly, is the absolute value of A times the absolute value of X, right? Equals the absolute value of B. Okay. Why is this true? That's what we all, ultimately, that's what we want, yeah. I mean, I'm, we're not done with the proof so, yet. We're not done yet, though. We're not done. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry about that, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, this will happen every now and again, of course. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. Why is this true? Well, look at, just look at this side for a second. The absolute value of AX, and this is something we're not going to prove in here, the absolute value of the product of two numbers is always the product of the absolute values. That's always true. So the absolute value of AX equals the absolute value of A times the absolute value of X. That's just something that we're assuming. Why is it equal to the absolute value of B? Because since AX equals B, just take the absolute value of both sides. The absolute value of AX equals the absolute value of B. And so that's where the last part comes from. Okay. Um, Okay, also I'm going to ask you this. Why is this true? 1 is less than or equal to the absolute value of x. Because x isn't 0. The absolute value of x then has to be at least 1. If it's not 0, right? Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to multiply this inequality through by the absolute value of A. Well, 1 times the absolute value of A is just the absolute value of A. It's less than or equal to the absolute value of A times the absolute value of X. When I say multiply through, of course, I'm, I'm talking about this, this inequality right here. Why can we do that? Why can we multiply both sides by the absolute value of A? Because A is not zero. Well, no, it's, it's not really that. It's that the absolute value of A is bigger than or equal to zero. It doesn't matter what A is. The absolute value of A is, it, by definition of absolute value, is bigger than or equal to zero. So we don't have to worry about flipping the signs. Right? This is, again, that should be something you think about. Every little thing you do, you should, you should know why you're doing it. Okay. And the last part of this is just remember that um, the absolute value of A times the absolute value of X equals B. Sorry, the absolute value of B. We get... 
that the absolute, absolute value of A is less than or equal to the absolute value of B. And that's what, exactly what it is that we were trying to prove. Okay, right? We just got that from over here. So all I'm doing is just replacing this with the absolute value of B, and that's what we wanted to show. Okay. Uh, let's see. And then we have one more, and that'll be the end of this theorem. And we're going to do one more theorem, and then we will be done. So let's see. I think, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and try to go to a new, a new page here. So I'm going to wait till everybody's got this done. Got this down, rather. Does everybody have this down? Anyone still writing? Are we okay? Okay. All right. So, this is, I'll stop boring you after this. Well, actually, that's not true. I'm just going to bore you with something different. Um, if A divides B and a divides C, then A is a factor of, or A divides BX plus CY, or any integers X and Y. Okay. In this case, I'm, I'm not going to write down what we're going to try to prove. I'm just going to write down the assumption, and then we'll, we'll just go ahead and do it. So we're going to suppose that A divides B and A divides C. And now we're going to let x and y be integers. Okay, so it's staring in the face right up here. This is what we're trying to show. A divides bx plus cy. Okay, so since a divides b and a divides c We have, okay, so I'm not going to use x and y in this case, but uh, we'll say alpha a times <coughs> alpha equals b and a times beta equals c. For some integers, alpha and beta, right? Okay. So again, just to be clear, let me let me label these two equations. This is one, and this is two. So just to give you some idea of where I'm going with this, and just also to help you maybe figure out some of these proofs, what it is it, what is it we're trying to prove? We're trying to prove that a divides bx plus cy. So in other words, we want to get a times something equals bx plus cy. And what we have is we have these two equations right here. So we need to get a times something equals bx plus cy. Well, what if we multiply both sides of this by x? Then we'll get the bx part, and we'll have an a on the left side. What if we multiply both sides of this by y? Then we'll have a times something equals cy. Then if we add them together, since each of the left-hand sides has an a, we can pull out the a to get a times something is equal to bx plus cy, which is what we want to prove. That's the idea. <clears throat> We're just trying to get it to where we can factor out a Basically, yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep, that's right. Yep, you got the right idea. Okay, so by these two equations, we have multiplying the first, a, uh, sorry, a alpha equals b multiplying both sides by x, we get a alpha x equals bx. And from a beta equals c, multiplying through by y, we get a beta y equals cy. Then we just add, and then it just falls out right away after that. So 
So we get A alpha X plus A beta Y equals BX plus CY, right? Just use the previous two equations, add the left sides together, that has to be equal to adding the right sides together because they're equations, right? And pulling out the A, we get A times alpha X plus beta Y equals BX plus CY. Okay, so again, remember I'm, I'm suppressing this, but the point is to know that A divides BX plus CY, it's not enough just to know that A times something equals BX plus CY. You need to know that A times an integer is BX plus CY. But because integers are closed under multiplication and addition, and these are all integers, we know that this is an integer. Right? But just be very careful, by the way, because this, this, this may happen. Later on, you may have to prove some things involving divisors and such. To prove that A divides B when A and B are integers, it's not enough just to show that A times X equals B for some real number X. That X has to be an integer. And that is going to actually, for some of you, is going to make you, you pull your hair out from time to time. But you have to remember that. Because A times B over A is always B. You can always cheat and say that. Oh, A times B over A is B, so A divides B. No, that's not the definition. It's A times an integer. So I'm saying this for a reason. You've got to, got to be really careful about this. this. If you're not careful, this will just sneak in because you're just going to say, well, I just want it to work out. I want it to be easy, so I'm just going to do that. Well, you can, but it's not going to be right. So just be warned about that. Okay, so be really careful about that. Um, I'll say more about that when we get to problems that involve this, this, kind, of, um, this kind of thing. So um, that's it. So that's the theorem. We're going to use some of this, actually, in, in what's um, about to... To come next. Okay, any questions so far? Yes? Just like before, now that we've been shown these proofs, we're not going to have to show the proof of the test, but we can refer to them and say, oh, because of. Yeah, that's right. G yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm not going to say, you know, on, fe on February 12th, what was Theorem 1C? I'm not going to do that. You know, I'm not going to say that. Um, did you have a question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, in this in this proof? Yeah. Uh, in this proof, it just doesn't come up. Okay. There's just no something being zero just doesn't create any problems in this case. Basically, because we're not trying to cancel or divide by it in this case. The other one we wanted to cancel the b, so we wanted to make sure it wasn't zero. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. So um, let me go into the next. Let me see here. What's? Oh, there we are. Okay. Ignore that. I just couldn't see the little. I'm getting old and blind. I can't see things anymore. Okay. Um, so we're going to talk about now is the GCD. And before we get into this, I'm just going to give you an example. This is something you certainly learned about a long time ago. Um, without defining it yet. Let's see, what are we on example two now? I think we are, right? I'm just going to assume you guys know what this is. GCD, greatest common divisor, right? That's what this stands for, greatest common divisor. So what's the greatest common divisor of 12 and 16? Have you all seen this before? You all learned this at some point? Okay. So it's basically it, it is just the biggest, uh, the biggest integer, the biggest natural number that divides both the numbers. That's it. That's what the GCD is. We're going to go a lot farther uh, with this um, in class now than than you did maybe in sixth grade or whatnot. Um, but what I'm going to do is actually I'm going to go to a new page here because I want all the room that I can get here, and I'm going to have to split it up soon anyway. So. All right. So before I actually define the GCD, what I'm going to do first is um, give you a theorem. And, and this, is, this is the last theorem that we're going to do today. I don't think the book does it exactly this way, but this is essentially what the book is doing. Suppose that A and B are integers
that are not both zero. What do I mean by not both zero? I mean, one of them could be zero. Okay? Maybe then they're, they're both non-zero or one of them zero. It's just that it's not the case that they are both zero. That's all I'm saying here. <clears throat> then there is a, and we've, we've seen this word before, a unique positive integer d satisfying these two conditions. A. D is a factor of A and D is a factor of B and the second condition is that um, if C is any integer such that C divides A and C divides B, then C divides D. And so C is also less than or equal to D. This, this follows right away from this, this uh, assertion. Okay. <clears throat> this D in your mind, this D is going to be the greatest common divisor. I just haven't defined it yet. But that's, we're going to prove a theorem that says that it exists first. And then we're going to say that that's exactly what the GCD is. This, this other condition may look a little bit strange to you at first. You might be used to thinking, okay, the greatest common divisor. Okay, well, I know it divides A and divides B. But greatest should mean that if C is any integer that divides A and B, then C is less than or equal to D. And the book actually states it that way. But then at the end of the section, they give you a theorem that says exactly this. And every other person except for the author, he lives in his own world, everyone else defines GCD this way. Everybody else does. Because this is a stronger, the C divides D is a stronger condition. It's just, it, it actually will be more useful to you when you're doing proofs. And it's equivalent to just saying C is less than or equal to D. If you just assume, if you just want to prove that C is less than or equal to D from that, you can actually prove that C has to be a factor, not only less than or equal to D, it has to be a factor of D as well. So you might as well just say the strongest thing you can when you're, when you're doing a theorem. You might as well just do it right away. Okay? So that's what we're going to do now. All right. So here's the idea. And um, it gets a little messy, but I would say it's, it's probably not as bad as the division algorithm. Okay, so we're going to assume that A and B are integers, and they're not both zero. Okay. So we have to show, the, just like with the division algorithm, we're going to show the existence first, and then we'll do the uniqueness. I may not even get to the uniqueness. I may just do the existence today, and then we'll do that on Thursday. There exists some in, um, positive integer d that has these two properties. So somehow we have to produce this integer d. And the way we're going to do this is kind of similar to how we did the, the, uh, the proof of the division algorithm. So what we're going to do is we're going to set the set s to be... Um, Let's see, I'm going to use the same notation the book does here. Okay. S is going to be the set XA plus YB, where X and Y are integers, and the sum is bigger than zero. Okay, that's the set S. So if you... How many of you have taken linear algebra? Okay, so you might recognize what this, there's a term for this maybe that you might recognize from linear algebra. If you haven't, don't worry about it. This set S is just all the integer linear combinations of A and B, right? That should look familiar to you if you remember linear combination from linear algebra, okay? Um, so what are we gonna do? Well, 
Think back to the proof of the division algorithm. What do you, if you remember what we did with that proof, I know you maybe haven't memorized it because you don't really have to, but what, what is it that we were trying to prove about S before with the division algorithm? We're going to do the same thing here. There's, what's the first thing? Do you remember? Anyone remember this? It's not empty. Exactly. It's not empty. Okay, so that's our first claim. So we claim that, um, that S is not empty. The book does this a certain way, but it, the way the book does it is not the best way to do it. I'm going to do it the best way. Um, so what do we know? We know that A and B are not both zero. At least one of them is not zero. So we're just going to assume A is not zero. The same argument applies if we assume B is not zero. Okay. Okay, let's say that A is not zero. Again, you, you may say, well, wh what if A is zero, and what if it's B that's the one that's not zero? Well, you just do the same argument I'm going to apply here, except you just do it to B. Then, okay, let's look at, um, let's look at this. A times A plus zero times B. Look at that expression right there. Forget about the, the bigger than zero for now. Just forget about that for now. Does this fit the form of the elements that are in S? Is this of the form something times A plus something times B? Yes. And when the somethings, of course, are integers. Yes, these are integers. And what is this equal to? This isn't a trick question. This is A squared. And since A is not zero, what can we say about a squared. This, I mean, you can say a lot of things about a squared. It's an integer. It's a square. It's greater than zero, or greater than or equal to one. Same thing. Yeah. All right? You guys buy that? So what can we say about a times a plus zero times b? It fits this form, and it's also positive. So it's an s, by definition of s. You guys seeing this? Okay, has the form it has to have, and it's also positive, and that's what we need for it to be an S. And since we know there's at least one thing in there, we know that S is definitely not the empty set. Okay, so now what can we do? Again, think back to what we did with the um, division algorithm. What can we say? There's a certain property we learned way back in the beginning of the course. We have this subset of positive integers that's not empty. What do we know about it? Yes. It has, it's, yes, it's well-ordered. So the set, yeah, exactly. So the well-ordering property, remember, says that any non-empty subset of the, uh, of the natural numbers has a least element. S is a non-empty subset of the natural numbers. Why is it a subset of the natural numbers? Because of this condition right here. It has to be bigger than zero. So it has the least element. Well-ordering property. Okay. I don't mean this as a derogatory term here. Okay. So don't say, oh, he's racist. No, I'm not. Okay. Um, Bless you. Okay, so there's certainly a least element D and S, right? Least element. What do we know about D? We, oops, oh, do it again, okay. Sorry. Small eraser. No, it's, yeah. Sorry. Okay. Let me go back to this. Okay. We know. Put an asterisk here. Hopefully I can fit this in. 
D equals XA plus YB, right? For some integers X and Y. Why is that true? Why is that true? Because why? It's an, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's an S. D is an S. And every element of S looks like this. So since D is in there, it's got to look like that. Okay? Just by definition of what S is. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to show that D has these properties up here, A and, A and B. We're going to show that that's true. Okay, so now what we're going to do is show that D, um, I, can't, I don't know what's wrong with me today, I'm sorry. Okay. There we go, okay. So let me just write this down. I don't think I've I'm reusing this character here. One, we're going to show that D divides A. Okay, so we're going to prove that. Now, you can't get that right away from this equation. You can't, because of this YB term. And showing that D divides A, we want to show that D times something is equal to A. You cannot get it directly from this, I can tell you. If you want to just monkey with it, you're not going to be able to get it. You got to do a little bit more work than, than that. Um, so what can we do? Well. What we can do is we can divide A by D using the division algorithm. And this is good review also, just so that you remember what this is saying. Okay, so if we're going to divide A by D using the division algorithm, what does the division algorithm say? Um, it says that A is equal to what? D times Q plus R for some integers Q and R. What's the special condition on R? Strictly less than, but yeah. Whatever you're dividing by, the remainder has to be between, uh, bigger than or equal to zero, but strictly less than what you're dividing by. Okay? What was the assumption that we had with the division algorithm? You guys are laughing for some reason. I don't know why you're laughing. Huh? Oh, okay. All right. Um, that's so lame, but okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, no, I know. I, hey, I appreciate your honesty. I was just curious. Um, what, what's that? That's well, yeah, that's what. Yeah, right. But that that is what we're actually going to try to show. Actually, so yeah. Um, that sounds good right now. Actually, are there Dairy Queens in Colorado Springs? I don't understand. Okay, good. Okay, I'm from Ohio, so I, don't know. I haven't seen any here. So yeah. Someone else from Ohio? Really? Seriously? Yeah. Okay, let's talk about that for like 20 minutes and just waste the rest of time. No, can't do that. But, yeah. I'm sorry. That, I'm sorry for you. Uh, Wait, you're in much... You Columbus. Columbus. <laughs> Dayton. No, yeah, Dayton. Mm. Dayton's scary, man. I've been to Dayton a few times and I've seen... I mean, it's a scary place. No, I have some... No, I have family around there. No. But, yeah, it's... Don't go to Dayton. Okay? Don't do it. If you go to Ohio, don't go to Dayton. Go to Cincinnati. That's there's where you need to go. Oh, no, no, no. I don't know. Okay. I heard that funny. I just thought he said, don't go to Dairy Queen. <laughs> that might actually be a good idea, too. But, um, okay, all right. I would love to chat about this. So we're going to have to get back to this. Okay. Um, well, so what we're going to show is um, that... Uh, R is equal to zero. That's what we're going to show. And I'll write this down again for you, but um, if you, what is it we're trying to prove? We're trying to prove that D divides A, right? If you know that R is equal to zero, then 
d divides a, right? d times something equals a, because the other piece is, is nothing. It's just zero. So we can prove what we want to prove if we know that r is zero. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to suppose that's not the case. Suppose not. Then what can we say about r? If r is not zero, then r is then st strictly squeezed in between zero and d, right? Because you already knew that it was bigger than or equal to zero, but if it's not zero, then it's strictly bigger than zero. Okay, so um, I don't want to, yeah, I'm running out of space here. So let me see if I can squeeze this in here. We already know that D has a certain form, right? That D is equal to XA plus YB, right? So, and I'll, hopefully I can get this in here. A is DQ plus R. Okay, I, I want to go too fast, but this part is just coming from just above. We already have that right here. Okay, you see that? I'm not just pulling this out of nowhere. It's just, it's just two lines above. But if we replace the D with what it's equal to, we know that this is equal to XA plus YB times Q plus R, right? You see what I did here? I just replaced the D with what it's equal to with that. Okay, everybody have this? We okay now? All right. Okay, so. Let's just distribute this. So this is XQA plus YQB plus R, right? If I distribute this, A is XA plus YB times Q plus R. Let's just distribute the, the Q through, keeping the A and the B on the right. So we get XQA plus YQB plus R. That's equal to A. So solving for R, what do we get? We get um, R is equal to, okay, A minus XQA um, minus YQB, right? You want to see what I did? Just look at the A, forget the middle part. The A on the left side, just, just subtract everything off over to the left so that we can get R by itself. And so what is this equal to? This is equal to 1 minus xq times a um, plus minus yq times b. Do you believe that? You guys believe that? So what can we say about r then? Well, okay, R remember the assumption on R. R was strictly between 0 and D. Remember that? R is strictly between 0 and D. So it's, po it's positive. R is positive, for one thing. But what else? So the fact that R is positive, and look at the form that we've expressed R in. What can we conclude about R now? R is in S, right? Because it's a linear combination, an integer linear combination of A and B, and it's positive. That's the definition of S. And okay, so what's the problem here? And now we've now we've got a problem. Are we saying that R is less than the least element? 
Yes, yes. Yes, exactly. Remember, remember, D was chosen to be the smallest element in S. You might have to go back a page. I'm not going to do that because we're running out of time. R was strictly between 0 and D. R is less than D, but it's in S. It's, a, it's an element in S that's smaller than D that contradicts the fact that D was the smallest element. Okay? So therefore, R had to be 0. It couldn't be non-zero because we get this contradiction. And then we get what we want. I'll just write this out again. This, this is already in your notes. We already, I already wrote this down. But 0 is less than R is less than D. And D is the least element of S. So this is impossible, right? So what do we conclude then from this contradiction? Oh, I just said it, I guess. So we conclude that, remember what we assumed to, that led to this contradiction. The assumption that led to this contradiction was that R was not zero. So therefore R has to be zero. And if you go back in your notes, what do we get? Um, we get that A is equal to, what was the original uh, equation? A equals DQ plus R, right? We div divided A by D. But since R is zero, this just becomes DQ. And we conclude that D divides A, right? Here's where, I'm, I'm going to write one more thing down. This is going to be really, really quick. And then we're going to stop. I'm not going to do it because the argument is exactly the same. Um, so all I'm going to say is, uh, by a similar argument, <coughs> D divides B. It is the same argument. You just do the same thing except with B instead of A. That's all. Okay, so we still have to prove the other condition, which we'll do. I'm not going to try to do it now. We'll do it next time. Then we'll talk about a couple problems, and we'll do more problems on Tuesday. So you should have time to, to you know, get the homework done. I'm going to give you the assignment now. Even though I haven't finished the section, I might as well just go ahead and give it to you right now. Um, hopefully I don't miss <laughs> I don't skip any this time. Homework. Okay, so this is section 2.3. Most of these have tons of parts to them, which I'm not going to make you, you do. Um, most of them I'm not going to make you do. So 1, 2, 4B, 6A and B, 12, 14A, 16, 20B, and 21B. Okay. Okay, so 1, 2, 4B, 6A and B, 12, 14A, 16, 20B, and 21B. Okay, so we will finish this up on Thursday. And again, this is, this is all that's due. That it'll be due next Thursday. Okay, and that's it. I'm not going to give you more homework on Thursday. That's, that's it. That's the whole assignment. If anyone didn't get